Welcome to St Martin's. Hello. My gran said I could come in here and have a look round while she's in the shops. Is that okay? Yes, yes, of course. Always good to see new faces. <laughs> oh, my name's Mr Talbot. My name is Mark. Uh, is there a dead body in here? No, no. This is an effigy. It's a sculpture of T.E. Lawrence by his friend Eric Kennington. What's he wearing? Is that a dagger? Yes, yes, he's dressed in the robes of an Arab prince, a title he was gifted for his bravery. A prince? Was he a knight too? Did he fight with a sword? <laughs> yes, 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 he did fight with a sword sometimes, uh, but sometimes he fought with his pen. He fought many battles. He was known as Lawrence of Arabia. He was a hero. He died in 1935 in a motorcycle crash on a road near Bovington. Was it an accident? Well, Mark, sometimes not all accidents are accidental. Albert, keep up. All right, Frank, I'm pedalling as fast as I can. This bike weighs a ton. Any more deliveries to do? Nah, that's it for today. Gentlemen of the jury, I much regret the necessity of calling you here today to inquire into the circumstances leading up to the death of a very gallant officer, known at the time of his death as Thomas Edward Shaw, better known to the rest of the world as Colonel Lawrence of Arabia. All men dream, Lawrence! but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds wake in the day to find that it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men. For they may act on their dreams with open eyes to make them possible. This, I did.
Mr. Gruff. I'll take it. Dangerous and troubling times, Ned. Don't you ever send a telegram, a note. For a desert warrior who enjoys danger, I would have thought this was very much your bet. You've had a long drive from London, Winston. What's on your mind? You heard of King Faisal's death? Yes, a great friend. Do you think it was heart failure or something more sinister? His passing was sudden. And the Swiss authorities were very suspicious. You suspect Cal's hand? Vernon Cal is a dangerous man. As head of the Secret Service, he had a motive. Faisal wanted to slow Jewish immigration in Palestine. A good reason to have him removed. I've spoken to Faisal's son and told him I will help. A fine bolt hole you have here. A place where one can live out their life in peace. You were always ready. To use a sword when it was necessary. The call to arms was only a means to an end. I will not miss the slaughter. The hour is coming, Ned. Dark clouds are gathering. Germany has reintroduced conscription and rebuilding her army. Our island will be our moated fortress once again. No, Winston. I've lived through enough nightmares for a thousand lifetimes. Not again. There are other ways of fighting, Ned. You've proved that many times. The next war will be won with intelligence. I think any man that starts a war shows a distinct lack of intelligence. Do you really think that we can curb the insanity of those pompous asses like Kel, who will happily lead millions of brothers and sons Husbands, fathers, friends, to be cut down by barbed wire bullets and hubris again. A lost generation, cattle to the slaughter. Two brothers I lost in the war, and my friend. Our enemies must be engaged with whatever weapons we have at hand. Secret service will be our weapon, Ned. It needs a new structure. It needs a faster drumbeat. Your leadership. A chivalrous knight battling dragons. Precisely. Like so many others, you are not mediocre. War is close. We need to grow our armory to meet them with dominant force. You have charisma. You lead. Others follow. These are your talents, Ned. If you can call them that. Ned, I am building a band of brothers. They need you to lead them. You would be the hub of our intelligence. And if I decline? You owe me no fealty. I, uh, I cannot force, cajole or order you. But in your heart, Ned, I know you want to. Mediocrity will never do for you. You would want to find peace and save lives. The next step? Come up to London next week, Wednesday. Meet with Amory, McDonough, 
Metchenhagen and myself. All good men. Very good men with enemies. Not as many as you have made, Ned. But in fighting our enemies, we need to get to know them. Get behind them, so to speak. Quite. So we can stab them in the back. I've already made contact with Henry Williamson. He's good friends with Oswald Mosley and has a line to Hitler. Already running with the hare and the hounds, Ned. Enjoy your weekend. So, another war is inevitable. It is written, my old friend. Nothing is written, lest it be so. You know that it will be so, Ned. There is one that will write it, and I, for one, will stop him. Have you ever read about Kit Marlowe's death, Ned? A playwright? No, should I? He was a spy, you know. It was rumoured. Things got too hot for him in England. His death was a fake. Be careful, Ned. You are being watched. Carol would be stupid not to. And he will oppose you. And, uh, you do attract notoriety, like bees around the honeypot. I shall use the press to make the right noises. above riches and concern for others above personal wealth. I will speak the truth at all times and forever keep my word. I will defend those who cannot defend themselves. I will uphold justice by being fair to all. I will be faithful in love and loyal in friendship. I will be generous to the poor and those who need help. I will forgive when asked that my own mistakes will be forgiven. I will live my life with honour. Ned! Ned! I met Florence on the lane. You're never really at ease, are you? Better win habits, I'm afraid. <laughs> How the devil are you both? Very well. Thomas is writing and I was bored. And I just needed to get away from the camp. <laughs> it's a beautiful spot, Ned. Isn't it? A lot to do, and the bruff always needs attention. Anyway, take a pew and I'll get us some lemonade. Ooh. Do you think he ever relaxes? Perhaps. But only when he's writing his letters or reading his books. Ah, his favourite. Sir Thomas Mallory, L'Amour Darker. Mm. Heroic knights and shining armor, dragons, damsels in distress. My secret passion, Florence. But I have a toast. To the seven pillars of wisdom. The first copies have arrived. Today. Well, God bless her and all who sail in her. <laughs> He likes your lemonade. Ned, the garden. I have to explore. <laughs> Are you well, Ned? You look melancholy. Consequence of conflict. Do you wish for those days as a desert hero? Exhausted. 
driven my body and spirit to breaking point. I've been absurdly overestimated. I'm most of the man. I'm quite ordinary. And now that I am plain private shore, maybe I can bury the myth of Lawrence of Arabia and I can live as myself. I'm not sure they know what to do with me. I know they want me out of the way. Winston tells me if there's any trouble brewing. But you tried to give the desert back to the Arabs. By your actions, you made many friends. Oh, and enemies, many enemies. They think I'm a spy for the Arabs. The Zionists think I will start an Arab uprising, but I just dwell on the lives lost. I've loved, but I will never love again. One day you'll find peace again, I'm sure. Damascus, Aqaba, Dera, they've all left their scars on me. Losing to whom? Even when the world is at peace, I seem not to be. I cannot stop. A perpetual engine. Ned, seek your peace and you will find it. I want so often find my peace with my friends. Here, in this oasis. It's a bloody paradise. <laughs> Thank you. I do enjoy it. Well, I'd better pedal back to camp. See you afraid, old chap. Just try keeping me away. Now, you must come to Max Gate next week. Maybe, but... Ah, now, none of your excuses. It's not a party unless you're there. Anyway, I wanted to talk to you about editing Thomas's memoirs. It would be a pleasure. I don't know, I promise. Our Bowenergis. Let's see if we can beat her this time. our target. Regular as clockwork. Lawrence. Well, he's going by the name of Shaw now, trying to hide. Where's he off to? Should we follow him? Well, it's a Wednesday. He'll visit Studland Beach. Um, he races the Swanish train on the way. So, let's go and take a snoop around the cottage. <laughs>
Mosley and I are agreed that a meeting would avert prolonged conflict. If you are indeed our man, I will visit Clouds Hill for lunch on Tuesday. You must meet Hitler. Let us begin this new age. Yours, Henry Williamson. Dear Winston, our meeting in London was very productive. Let us proceed. I have arranged to meet Williamson. Keep me appraised of any potential local interference. Yours, T.E. For your own good, Edward, you must always obey and be dutiful to your mother's commands. Be attentive to what she teaches you in all things. Come here, Edward. Shut the door. I love you, Mother. I love you, too. Enough? You know why you're here? Yes, Mother. You know you have done wrong? Yes, Mother. Well, you know what to do. Remember what I taught you. This is your punishment, your pain. Conquer it. Own it. Learn to love it, and it will no longer be pain. The pain will purge your sins. Begin to count down. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. It's over, Mother. Your staff is broken. Your charms are all overthrown. Come back, Edward. Come back now. Take your punishment, boy. Don't dare turn your back on me, boy. Come back, you little bastard. become immortal. We will be heroes. No mercy. No mercy. Stop. 
Now that I'm plain old private shore, maybe the myth of Lawrence of Arabia can be buried and I can live in peace. Good work, Terrell. Thank you, sir. He's bloody clever. He covers his tracks. Things do seem to be developing, don't they? I had suspected that Churchill was behind the proposal to replace me, and that Lawrence had made a number of attempts to throw us off the scent. We shall have to watch and wait. See how things develop. That little man has his finger in all sorts of pies. And he's very unpredictable. Says one thing, does another. His appointment would certainly bugger things up. And if things do develop... Well, now we have to decide what to do. And how to do it. Christ. First of all, they want some bloody Nazi sympathizer and American harlot on the throne. And now they want a bloody sadomasochistic little bastard as leader of the British Secret Service. Well, both are equally unacceptable. And both are problems I fully intend to eliminate. Eliminate? Eliminate. Let's take a look at... Lawrence's ever-growing file, shall we? Oh, 
Lawrence studies at Jesus College, Oxford, Arab scholar, archaeologist. Thesis on Crusader castles, he cycles 2,400 miles through France and walks 1,100 miles in Syria. He can't fault his stamina. In 1914, Lawrence is sent to Cairo. When the Arab Revolt begins in 1916, he and Sheriff Faisal campaign against the Turks. 1917 through 1918, he leads a number of attacks, including capture of Aqaba, and is wounded in combat. Turks put a price on his head, 20,000 pounds. In 1917, he is captured and tortured, so he says, but manages to escape. 1918, he leads the capture of Damascus. Faisal gives him the status of son. So, we have a prince. Returns to England, where he is promoted to colonel. He is requested to an audience with George V, where he is to be given a knighthood, which he refuses. A situation for which in 1,000 years the palace has no protocol. In 1919, he's a member of Faisal's delegation at the Paris Peace Conference. Survives aircraft accident in Italy, but killed everybody else. Lucky bastard. But to reward him and get him out of the way, they offer him the post of Viceroy of India, which he refuses. 1922, he works with Churchill to achieve some degree of Arab self-rule after which he tries to join the RAF under a pseudonym, which fails when someone recognises him from the plethora of newspaper photos. He joins the RAF as T.E. Shaw, publishes tales of his so-called exploits. In 1926, more publicity and fears of him being involved with the Arabs again. We get him posted to India, where he gets involved with spying in Afghanistan and encouraging India's independence movement. Then, earlier this year, he retires from service, so now he's a civilian, and we can't hide him anymore. He sets himself up in his Dorset cottage, where rather than gardening, lying around relaxing or even basket weaving, he is still stirring up the Arabs. He's pissing off the Jews in Palestine and buggering up our control of the Suez Canal. And at the same time, he is talking with Mosley and his black shirts, and not just about meeting Hitler, but becoming their leader. And the crowning turn in this water pipe that he is working with Churchill to bloody replace me. Now, if somebody isn't going to annihilate this little shit, then I will! A bullet would be clean, but may I suggest something more subtle? Something the great unwashed would not suspect and would elevate his reputation as a hero. Well, what's better than a hero? A fallen hero. Tragic death. On his motorcycle. Perhaps an unfortunate collision. A mishap. Yeah. Yes, that does have some merit. An unfortunate accident. Just into his retirement using a motor vehicle as a weapon. That's certainly inventive. Is your man reliable? Dick? Yes. He needs a little Dutch courage. But he'll do what he needs to do. Good. Well, it must be done soon. And very discreetly. No loose ends. Do you understand me? No loose ends.
It would be wonderful to see you again. Your last visit was most entertaining. You would be most welcome to join a few guests at a weekend party, including Mr. Baldwin at Clifton. We understand there is a potential reorganisation of the forces proposed and would like to understand the upheaval. Yours, Lady Nancy Astor. My apologies, Lady Astor, but no. Neither Prime Minister nor wild mares would at present take me from Clouds Hill. Also, there is something broken in the works. I urge you to visit me at Barnstable at your earliest opportunity. Oswald Mosley is keen for you to meet Hitler next month. War in Europe is seen by the National Socialists as inevitable, but your input could bring about an environment of negotiation. Yours, Henry Williamson. It seems I've had uninvited guests again. And a telephone number. for it. Well, we better tell the police when we get back to the village. Agreed. Yes, we're late already. Look at the time. Hang on, Peter. Look, the name. Richard Crichton. Oh. Well, at least we've got a name to give to the police. Hmm? So then, Dick, what did your bloodhound senses sniff out then? It looks like you were right. He is talking to the black shirts. They're setting him up to meet Hitler next month. Henry Williamson and Mosley? Just so. This is getting out of hand. If he does talk to Mosley and Hitler, war may not be the foregone conclusion that Kell and the others are hoping for. We can't allow that, can we? And your boss's plans of appeasement would be scuppered. Just imagine what it could do to all those bank accounts and balance sheets, eh? So, what else do you find? A communication to the King of Jordan. 
It's written in Arabic, I think. It looks like Kel was right on this one. I've taken it. Mm. Oh dear. Talking with the Arabs, eh? It seems our little exhibitionist friend may have just crossed a big red line. We should report back to Kel in London. Oh, relax, dear boy. We'll be back by this evening. And I know a charming little pub on the edge of the New Forest where we can top you up. So, you find a bunch of old clothes hidden in the forest. Not exactly one for Sherlock Holmes, is it? Perhaps an old biddy hid them as a drop box for a friend. A kid's game, perhaps. It was just damn peculiar. And there was a name in the hat. Richard Crichton. Richard Crichton. No, not a name I know. Look, aren't you going to write this down? Richard Crichton. Happy? Look, why don't you go back out before it gets dark? Collect the clothes, bring them back here, then at least we'll have all the physical evidence. We do have time. Right. Come on. Couple of bloody boy scouts. I'm sure this is the right spot. Huh. No, nothing. Look, old man, I've had enough mysteries for one day. Uh, we've reported to the police. It's in the sergeant's little black book. I think we've done our duty. Quite so. Bloody waste of time. Come on, Preston. Let's see if we can get back to the village in time to down a pint before going home. Yeah. <laughs> Florence, you've got my notes. Ned, it's so wonderful to see you. You look well. I'm glad to be home. I feel old. Old and tired. You should retire. Retire? Oh, I still have things to do. Besides, I think Winston has a little job for me. You've heard from Winston? He's annoyed at the Jewish migration to Palestine. Destabilizing, he says. Be careful there, Ned. He's a cunning old fox, a user. England's changed. And the British you burned as a youth have created powerful, dangerous enemies. I know. I know. The Jews, Allenby, the Secret Service. Don't go adding anyone else to a growing list. Bloody baffles. The sense of purpose that keeps me going. Being in Arabia, I learned we're all immortal for a limited time. Just be careful, Ned. I feel uneasy, apprehensive. The world is moving into a state of darkness and flux. But for us heroes, readiness is all. Let's walk down to the village. This hero needs a cup of tea.
Monsieur Laurence. Jean Renard, Le Figaro, Monsieur Laurence. Get off my property. Do you intend to become leader of the Black Shirts? Do you oppose the Jewish settlement in Palestine? Jackal, vulture. Leave me alone, for God's sake, leave me alone! Remember what I taught you. This is your punishment, your pain. The pain will purge your sins. No, it only takes a few pounds of pressure to kill. Monsieur, no! S'il vous plaît! Tell your friends the old fire is not yet extinguished. Six, five, four, three, two, one. It has been announced that Mr. T. E. Shaw, known as Lawrence of Arabia, currently an aircraftman with the Royal Air Force, is to retire from active duty. It is his intention to enjoy his retirement in seclusion at its cottage, Clouds Hill, in Dorset. He has asked that his privacy be respected. Ha <laughs> ha! Confuse and confound the enemy, Ned. Confuse and confound them. Clemmy, Clemmy, you must come and read this. Uh, highly entertaining. Prime Minister's office. Hello, Ramsey. You were right. He is indeed a loose cannon. Unpredictable. An agitator. Well, most of his friends are writers. His allies are Churchill and Lady Astor. A highly influential. Exactly. Well, for the rest of our class, the little bastard has exasperated the royal family, angered the war office, and infuriated us here at the Secret Service. Oh, I just need your verbal sanction. Thank you, Ramsay. Thy will be done. There was once a merchant in Baghdad who, while in the marketplace, was jostled by someone in the crowd. When he turned, he saw it was death. Death looked at him and reached out to him. The merchant ran home and, wanting to escape, took his horse and rode as fast as he could. I will go to Samarkand and their death will not find me, he said. Exhausted on his arrival that evening, the merchant went to the marketplace and he saw death standing in the crowd. Boldly he went to death and said, why did you threaten me when you saw me this morning? I did not threaten you. Death said, it was only a start of surprise. I was astonished to see you in Baghdad for I had this appointment with you this night in Samarkand. Assalamu alaikum, hello Rans. Wa alaikum, assalam. It's been a long time, hello Rans. I've missed you so much, old friend. You should come with me. What? Where? The desert. Don't worry. Home. Your time is close. 
He waits for you on the way to Samarkand. Inshallah. If Allah wishes it, I will come. Thank you, my friend. Until later, Edwards. Go in peace. Salam alaikum, Edwards. Wa alaikum, assalam. Be patient with him, Lord. Yes, sir. We got the letter to Abdullah translated from the Arabic dialect. It confirms plans for an Arab uprising in Palestine, possibly led by Lawrence. He's also getting close to the Black Shirts and Mosley, either to infiltrate or join them, which would be embarrassing whichever way you jumped. I understand, sir. I'll liaise with operations if we need anything. And the timing? As soon as possible. Certainly, sir. That's what we were planning. Well, thank you, sir. I'll call tomorrow to confirm success. And good night to you, sir. Well, 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 Crichton. England's most famous and courageous queer is not liked by Kay. Hmm. Not liked at all. We, um, we need to pick up a few things and go back very early tomorrow morning. We need to stop a dead man walking. Kay has given the green light. You know, Dick, some people say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, we're about to show our poet friend the true meaning of the word hurt, eh? Now, come on. Let's get you down to that restaurant. This place is famous for its beef, Wellington, and you look like you need feeding up for the busy day ahead. Why does Kel want him dead? Is it Mosley and the black shirts? The Zionists, the Arabs. His job. Who cares? Richard Crichton Whitehall. Secret Service not being very secret.
morning, Mr. Shaw. I think I might spend some time in my garden this afternoon. Yes, beautiful. Um, do you have an envelope? I have this telegram, a parcel, and this letter to send to oh, Devon. Mr. Churchill. <laughs> and Henry Williamson, Shallowford Bailey, Devon. Oh, my sister lives in Devon, you know. Yeah, I haven't seen her in over a year now. Her young un must be, what, six or? May I just check? Lunch, Tuesday, wet fine cottage, one mile north, bobbing to camp. Sure, yes. Right you are, Mr Shaw. Uh, the uh, parcel and the letter will be sent this afternoon and the telegram will go straight away. Now, where have you put my telegram, book girl? Sure. But you were Lawrence, a prince of Arabia. I was once, but I left that man in the past. But the past is a part of us. It is who we are. We must learn but from I, it. I needed to forget him. Your past is internal, my lord. It is all around you. You cannot run from it. I wanted a new destination. Here. For remembrance on your journey, my prince, be ever watchful. For you travel a long and dangerous road to where your friends are waiting. Don't mind her. She's a little bit, you know. <laughs> Damn. I had an important telegram to send to my friends in his London hotel. I've left it in the cottage. No problem. You just drop it round when you're ready. Oh, mind, I might be out back because I've got to plant some seedlings. Thank you. Have a nice day. Into his quietness. Good. It is time. Finish it. And death awaits him on the road to Samarkand. Albert, keep up. All right, Frank, I'm pedaling as fast as I can. This bike weighs a ton. Any more deliveries to do? Nah, that's it for today. Take care, Frank. I think I hear something coming. Mr. Lawrence. Thanks, Mr. Shaw.
Do you think he's stable? Well, he's certainly stronger today, but if he survives, I doubt he'll either walk or speak again. Oh, can I, can I help you, sir? Oh, you can't smoke in here. Whitehall 278. Yes. A glancing blow, sir, but just enough. Well, the car's already in London, sir. <clears throat> well, yes, sir, the security lockdown is in place. Yes. Press blackout, though the Times has broken the story. Also, special D notices have been posted. Well, yes, of course. Yes. We've closed down the cottage as well. We have the local boys in blue guarding the grounds to keep out the press and the over-curious. Well, Clayton is going to make sure the boys have their story straight and I'm going to see George Brough in the morning. We may have a problem with Catchpole. Well, he and his boys did see the car, but I'm sure I can exert some pressure there. Well, yes, sir. We've confiscated a number of books and private papers and we've also recovered the letters and the telegram we were anxious about. Well, no, it hadn't been sent, but it was addressed to an Arab in the London Hotel. Well, yes, sir, it does confirm your suspicions. Oh, how is he? Critical. Hanging on. I'll give him his due, he is a fighter. The doctor says if he does survive, he'll be unable to speak. Well, quiet. Let's not take that risk. Well, I'm sure we can hasten him to the arms of Allah. And good day to you, sir. Good night, sweet Prince of Arabia. May angels sing you to your rest. Two with me. Thank you, officer. My colleague and I may be back tomorrow.
George Bruff. I came as soon as I heard of Lawrence's accident. Yes, tragic accident. These are fine machines you make, Mr. Bruff. Quite so. And you are? I work for the government. The government? What can I do for you? We need you to examine the bike and confirm that it was mechanically sound. Certainly. Give me a few moments. Of course, it's mechanically sound. The bike has been struck by something here on the right-hand side. You clearly see the black paint, damage to the tank, headlights, the footrest. Brake cable broke on impact, and uh, I, th I think would also like to say that the uh, handlebars and footrest made a considerable gouge on the road. Well, we had established the paint was damaged on impact with the road. No, no, nonsense, man. No, 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 no. The impetus on the right-hand side, the bike slid on its left-hand side. You can see the scratch marks on the chrome here. Pure supposition, Mr. Bruff. It could simply be older damage. You see, in our investigation, we only need to know if the machine was mechanically sound. No, 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 no. That, that's not the cause of the accident. You see, the bike was struck by something on the right-hand side. Our government engineers will judge the cause. Look, I don't know who you are. But Lawrence was the finest rider I have ever met. On the many times I rode with him, I can clearly say that he... He treated other riders with the utmost consideration, never saw him take a single risk, nor did he put other road users at the slightest inconvenience. No, 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 no. I cannot believe, nor will accept, that Lawrence made an error. So, the facts. Going back to the bike, it was struck on the right-hand side by something. Mr. Brook. Your business is a successful one, is it not? And I am sure you wish it to remain so. Surely you wouldn't want one of our engineers to suggest that a... Bruff motorbike... One of your own motorbikes could have had any potential faults. And then there is this. Of a very pretty picture, is it? Where the bloody hell did you get this? It would be regrettable if it was to somehow just slip out. So, the bike was mechanically sound. The bike was mechanically sound. Well, thank you for your help, Mr. Bruff. It's been invaluable. Good day to you, sir. Which part of the government did you say you worked for? I didn't. Mr. T. E. Shaw, Lawrence of Arabia, which occurred shortly after eight o'clock yesterday morning. Mr. Shaw was injured in a motorcycling accident on Monday night and did not recover consciousness. Tragic as it is that such a remarkable career should have been ended by a simple road accident, 
if his fight for life had succeeded, it would still have been a tragedy, for Mr. Shaw's brain was irreparably damaged. Lawrence's commander, Viscount Allenby, said, In Colonel Lawrence, I have lost a good friend and valued comrade. He left to us who knew and admired him a beloved memory, and to countrymen an example of a life well spent in the service. He constantly prayed for peace because as a soldier he suffered the deepest of wounds and most horrific of scars. The BBC spoke to the journalist Lowell Thomas who reported on Lawrence's service in Arabia. The world looks with some awe upon a man who appears indifferent to home, money, comfort, rank, or power and fame. He spent his time hiding from admirers, reporters, publishers, autograph collectors, and every species of hero worship. He was a man whose name will go down in history, along with those of Francis Drake, Walter Raleigh, Lord Gordon, and other legendary heroes of Britain's glorious past. His friend Winston Churchill spoke to the BBC. We have lost one of the greatest beings of our time. I had the honour of his friendship. I hope to see him quit his retirement and take a commanding part in facing the dangers which now threaten this country. His was an untimely death. His name will live in English letters. It will live in the annals of war. It will live in the legends of Arabia. Bloody hell, Ramsay! Bloody hell! Why didn't you deem to tell me? Of course he knew. I knew. You sanctioned it. You're a bloody fool, Ramsay. A bloody fool! Bloody hell! Bloody hell! So, Mash Allah, God has willed it, the uncrowned prince, the great El Lawrence is dead. Corporal, 7581979, exemplary record. The inquest for Mr T. Shaw is tomorrow. You are to give evidence. Sir. And your evidence? I witnessed the accident, sir, together with my platoon. We observed the black car. As it passed Shaw's motorbike, uh, it, I thought it seemed to glance the motorcycle. Thought? You're not paid to think. You're a bloody soldier. Permission to ask a question, sir. 
Shaw retired from active service two months ago. He's a civilian now. Why is this a military matter? Bloody insolent man! And that's why I'm here, Catchpole. You see, Mr Shaw was privy to a number of official secrets, and it is important for national security that these are not compromised. Can I make a suggestion? Corporal Catchpole here is an excellent soldier. He is representing his mates, and he wants to do right by them. He wants no doubt attached to his character, no stain on his exemplary record. He merely needs to state what he saw. He saw the motorbike pass the car. But, but surely, sir, it's imperative the inquest have all the relevant facts, sir. And they will. Given his exemplary record and his sound testimony, I'm sure a promotion would be assured. A sergeant, perhaps. Increased remuneration to take care of his wife, Georgina, and their beautiful baby daughter. How are they? And if his testimony is less sound, then there are a number of long-term postings in our great empire to which his talents could be applied. So, he needs to make the right decision. Can you make the right decision, Ernest? I observed the motorcycle pass the car, but the car... You observed the motorcycle pass the car? I observed the motorcycle pass the car. I observed the motorcycle pass the car. Now, there is a statement I think we can all agree with. Officer material, this one, I'm sure. You're dismissed. Get out. You didn't mean what you said about employing his talents elsewhere. Oh, yes. Egypt is particularly warm this time of year. After the inquest, I'm sure you can make it happen. Make him go away. I'm eternally grateful for your help with this one. You wouldn't believe the flat this would have created. <coughs> uh, now, would you mind awfully if I uh, made bold of your office to make a phone call to Whitehall? Well, certainly, uh, That's great. glad to be an assistant. Thank you, sir. And good day, sir. Whitehall 278. Thank you. Yes, sir. The place is still locked down. Guards are at Clouds Hill, and Special Branch are also outside the camp. Yes, sir. Crichton has squared up the boys. The evidence from Bruff only states the vehicle was roadworthy, and Catchpole has buckled. His mates won't back him up either. Afraid of the consequences. Yes. Yes, sir. Well, I think we have all the stories aligned. Hmm. Oh, the coroner. Neville Jones, ex-army. I had a chat with him. At national security and all that. I think we can rely on him to play the straight bat. Hmm. Well, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And good night to you, sir. So, 338171, Air Craftsman Shaw, aged 46. Hmm. Only 11 weeks. Possibly the shortest retirement on record. Mr. T. E. Shaw, formerly Colonel Lawrence, will take place at Morton Church, Dorset, at 2.30 p.m. on Tuesday. The service will be a simple one. Apart from those specially invited, the service will be confined to his particular friends and those who were associated with him in the radio. Members of the jury, I much regret the necessity of calling you here today to inquire into the circumstances leading up to the death of a very gallant officer known at the time of his death as Thomas Edward Shaw, 
better known to the rest of the world as Colonel Lawrence of Arabia. Now, despite the best efforts and the skill and devotion of the medical men who attended him, and of course the rest of the hospital staff, he died on Sunday last. Now, once you've heard all the evidence, it will be for you to bring in your verdict. As to the actual cause of death, you'll hear evidence today, medical evidence from Mr. Hugh Cairns, the neurosurgeon who carried out the post-mortem examination, and your verdict will be in accordance with that medical evidence heard. I call the first witness, Mr. Hugh Cairns, please. My name is uh, Mr Hugh Cairns. I'm a neurosurgeon based in London. At approximately uh, 11.45 on the 13th of May 1935, Mr T.E. Shaw and Hargreaves were admitted to the hospital at Bobbington. Hargreaves was examined and found not to be so seriously injured. Mr. Shaw was taken up the theatre where he was found to be deeply unconscious. Together with my colleague, uh, Captain Charles Allen, we came to the conclusion that he was suffering from severe head injuries. We had the skull x-rayed. Now the deceased remained unconscious until his death at uh, 8 a.m. on the 19th May. 1935. With the uh, agreement of relatives, we carried out a post-mortem examination, which showed a very severe fissured fracture on the left-hand side of the head. The brain was severely lacerated. Prior to death, a congestion of the lungs had set in. In my opinion, the cause of death was the fracture of the skull, lacerations of the brain, heart failure and congestion of the lungs. His injuries would not have been fatal if he had been wearing a crash helmet. Right, thank you, Mr Cairns. Next witness, please, Mr Frank Fletcher. I live in Ellis Road, Bovington Camp, and I'm 14 years of age. On the 13th of May, 1935, at about 11.20 a.m., I was riding my bicycle from Bovington Camp towards Clouds Hill, and Albert Hargraves was with me. I was riding at the front, and Hargraves was riding at the back. We were on the left of the road. When opposite Clouds Hill Camp, I heard a motorcycle coming up from behind, and then heard a crash, and Bert's bicycle fell on top of me and knocked me off my bicycle. I got up and saw Mr Lawrence go over the handlebars of the motorcycle and fall about five yards in front. I went over to Bert who gave me his butcher's book and I saw three pennies lying on the road. He then seemed to fall asleep. There are a lot of men running over from the tents. Did you see any other vehicles on the road at any point? No sir, there were no other cars on the road then. I did not pass a car from the time I left Bovington Camp in the accident. Did you leave the road at any time? I did not leave the road at all, sir. Were you riding in the middle of the road, Frank? I was riding close to the left-hand side, between one and two yards. When the crash occurred, the other boy was not at my side. I do not know what part of the road the motorcyclist was on at the time of the accident. After Bert's bicycle struck me, I looked up and saw the motorcycle about five yards in front, in the direction in which I was going, and the rider going over the handlebars. Thank you, Frank. Next witness, please, Master Albert Hargreaves. I am 14 years of age and I live in Bovington Camp. I'm employed as an errand boy by Dodge & Co Butchers, Bovington Camp. 
On the 13th of May 1935, I was riding from Bovington Camp to Turner's Puddle. Frank Fletcher was with me for company. Opposite Clouds Hill Camp, I was riding four or five feet behind Fletcher and on the left hand side of the road. I heard the sound of a motorcycle coming from behind. No motor car passed me about this time or any traffic of any sort. I do not remember any more until I found myself in hospital. I do not even remember being thrown off my bicycle. Hmm. Well, how were you riding your bicycle? Were you um, talking? What was your position in the road? When we left the camp, we were riding abreast. We changed positions when we heard the noise of the motorcycle. We had been riding in single file and were not talking and had been riding one behind the other for about 10 minutes. I slowed up and got behind Frank. I did not wobble at all. Given your stature, this bicycle seems somewhat large for you. The bicycle is the right size for me. I just have to breach a little for the pedals. Thank you, Albert. Final witness, Corporal Ernest Catchpole. I urge you not to do anything too courageous. <clears throat> I'm Corporal 7581979 Ernest Catchpole, stationed at Tidworth. At about 11.20 a.m. on the 13th of May 1935, I was at Clouds Hill camping ground with my platoon. And we heard the sound of a motorcycle coming from the direction of Bovington Camp. When I saw the motorcycle, it was uh, doing between 50 and 60 miles an hour. Just before the motorcycle drew level with the camp, it passed a private black car going in the opposite direction. The car was close to the middle of the road. I then saw the motorcyclist swerve uh, across the road to avoid two pedal cyclists going in the same direction. The motorcycle swerved immediately after passing the black car going in the opposite direction. I would say the accident occurred 15 to 20 feet after the motorcycle passed the car. I then heard a crash and I saw the motorcycle twisting and turning over and over along the road. I immediately ran to the road and called for help. I found the motorcyclist lying on the right-hand side of the road. His, his face was covered in blood and I sent to the camp for a stretcher. None of the other witnesses observed a car. Could you have been mistaken, perhaps? No, sir. Thank you, Corporal Catchpole. Now, the only other information is that regards the motorcycle, a bruff superior. Now, I have a statement here from the manufacturer, Mr. George Bruff. On examination, no obvious mechanical fault was apparent. The only conflicting evidence is that with regards to the black car. Now, I don't think the car had anything to do with the accident. However, the fact that Corporal Catchpole there is certain that he saw it, there were no other witnesses to it, and the boys are adamant they did not see it. Well, it's all rather unsatisfactory, is it not? Now, you've heard all the evidence. I don't think you'll have too much difficulty arriving at your verdict. The facts are all there to see that the collision was indeed an accident. Of that there can be little or, or no doubt. Now, why the deceased rode into the rear of the pedal cycle, we shall never know. The evidence would suggest that Mr Shaw was travelling at great speed, lost control of his motorcycle. I don't think there can be any other conclusion on the evidence. And under the circumstances, you will doubtless consider the proper verdict to bring in would be one of accidental death. The verdict. Thank you. Death caused by injuries sustained accidentally. 
And needless to say, I completely concur with your verdict. And I'm sure you would wish to pass on your sympathies, as well as my own, to Mr Shaw's relatives at this and their very sad loss, and the country's loss of such a gallant Englishman. The inquest is therefore adjourned. Why can't they find the black car? The boys were very well rehearsed. Catch ball was very convincing. You will admit to your statement regarding the black car from the final records? Oh, yes, of course, yes. I think with the, uh, with the witnesses of such variance, uh, I see no reason to set the hairs running unnecessarily, do you? Well, not at all. Are uh, the funeral set for 2.30 today, is that right? Yes, quite so. Well, best to draw the line under the fur as soon as we could. <laughs> My thanks. I will, of course, inform Whitehall that your support has been invaluable. You're you. proud of yourself, little man. You murdered a hero, a prince, an uncrowned king. I know you were the driver of that car. Well, we'll just keep that between ourselves, won't we? You see, Ernest, truth is all a matter of power and perspective. We can rewrite history however we please. And the common man never actually believes the naked truth. He's too scared. Too spineless. You'll get your reward. And your twisted conspiracies of silence. One word of truth rings out like a pistol shot. I, for one, will make sure that shot is heard. No, you won't. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh even from the Lord, who hath made heaven and earth. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in, from this time forth for evermore. After this I looked, and behold a great multitude, which no man could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Lawrence was one of those rare beings who seemed to belong to the morning of the world. He did his duty as he saw it. He was an exceptional human being who achieved so much even after Arabia. His end would have pleased him. A swift rush and a silent passing.
The king is dead. Long live the king. God may forgive you, damn you. I don't. Winston. The day after he passes, we have the inquest and his funeral. In unholy haste, they couldn't get him out of the way and into the ground quick enough. They wanted a quiet affair, well, without ceremony. Too many questions being asked more lightly. You couldn't stop them, could you? Mrs Hardy, it was beyond my power. I'm very sorry. You will make it right, won't you? Yes. Ned will not be forgotten. Lawrence was tremendously outspoken. He was direct and sometimes brutally honest. Do you know, in his last communication to me, he described him as a wild mare. Indeed, a man of rare perception. This, uh, this is not England's proudest moment. We have lost a great man. Uh, I fear, whatever our need in the coming years, we shall never see his like again. He once told me that when he was angry, he prayed for God to swing our globe into the fiery sun to prevent the sorrows of the not yet born. Politicians uh, would be wise uh, to prepare for such sorrows. It's always remarkable that the ones who love war are not young men, but politicians. Small, middle-aged men with fat bellies and short legs. Allenby. Sir Ronald. Colonel Newcomb. Bradbury. Uh, you know Lady Astor. Thank you for coming, sir. It was the least I could do. He was a great soldier. Yeah, it did make a difference, sir. Absolutely. But uh, rather unorthodox. <laughs> he was bloody infuriating, sir. But I, for one, would have had it no other way. I eternal thanks for coming. My brother would have been overwhelmed by the show of emotion. Your brother was extraordinary. There's no other man I know who could have achieved what Lawrence did and be utterly unconcerned whether any kudos was awarded him or not. My brother was just a man, and I will miss him dreadfully. He would hope that he inspired his fellow man to lead extraordinary lives. And Ned would want to wish that your life's journey were similarly enlightening and extraordinary. My apologies. I must thank the canon for the service. Well, I will return to my salmon fishing. 
and Clem and I back to Chartwell. Have you arranged it as you said you would? Yes, Clemmy. All organised. On your knees. On your knees. Surely you wouldn't begrudge an Englishman a final cigarette. Okay. Bye, Lawrence. See you. We're all immortal for a limited time. May 11th, 1935. Ernest. My thanks for helping to fix the bruff. Your passing the cottage was fortuitous, and your strong conviction to flush the fuel system, proving to be sandy from an ill-advised trip to Studlin Beach, was justified. As a token of my gratitude, I've asked my publisher to send you a copy of Seven Pillars, which I hope to autograph for you when you next pass the cottage. Best regards to your family, Ned. pistol shot, and I for one will make sure that shot is heard. I loved you, so I drew these tides of men into my hands and wrote my will across the sky and stars to gain you freedom the seven-pillared worthy house that your eyes might be shining for me when I came. Death seemed my servant on the road till we were near and saw you waiting. When you smiled and in sorrowful envy he outran me and took you apart into his quietness. History teaches us to seek the truth by viewing the events of the past through the optics of the present. The British Pathé newsreel of Lawrence's funeral has the air of stage management in an age before television, there was nothing more influential than what millions saw in the cinema every week to sway public opinion. Two days after Lawrence's funeral, a trans-Jordanian citizen, an emissary of King Abdullah, was killed in a hit and run as he crossed the street outside his London hotel. The driver of the black car failed to stop, and the vehicle and its owner were never traced. Churchill became Prime Minister in May 1940, and on the 10th of June, Kell, the head of MI5, a post he had held for 30 years, was sacked. 
The change of direction reinvigorated the wartime MI5. At the end of the war, Churchill stated that the work of the Secret Service shortened the conflict by more than two years, saving thousands of lives. A century has passed since the Paris Peace Conference, at which Lawrence, Churchill, and King Faisal were delegates. They championed self-governance for the Arab nations. Instead, the English and French simply drew borders on a map, dividing the spoils. The Arabs' claims were ignored, and Arab leaders have never forgotten or forgiven this betrayal. This reckless lack of foresight sowed the seeds of the endless conflicts across the Middle East, which rage to this day. And what of Lawrence, the uncrowned King of Arabia? Rumors amongst the locals at his funeral said the coffin was empty and that Lawrence had survived. Others said that as a prince, he was akin to King Arthur, a once and future king, and that he would return one day to fight for good and redress evil. There were even rumors that he had been spirited away by Churchill to work for British intelligence in Morocco during the war where eventually he died in Tangiers in 1968. But that was all just a rumor, folklore, and merely another legend of Lawrence after Arabia. <sighs> Into his quietness.
another riding the whirlwind.